morning. Welcome to Fairview Baptist Church Online. We are so glad you have joined in. Whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, we are glad you're here. We'd like for you to get a cup of water. Make sure you have your Bible ready because we're going to have some great preaching in just a moment. But right now, we want to lead you in a few worship songs and just speak about how good God is. Would you pray with me as we begin? Father, good morning to you. Thank you for your great watch care over us as we slept last night. Thank you for your protective hand and your guarding, uh, watchful eye. We pray now as we sing to you that you receive it, Father, as an incense of sweet prayer and offering to you. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
time to worship. Worship our King, our Savior, and our Lord. Hope you have your Bibles ready now as we get ready to hear a word from Pastor Bill Ledbetter. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's good to be with you. It has certainly been an interesting week for the Fairview family and the folks who live in southeastern Oklahoma and especially in Durant, Oklahoma. On Wednesday, we had a cluster of storms come through and spray us with tornadoes. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, not very many people lost their lives. And we're thankful that our people, although some some have experienced property damage, we've had no serious injuries and no one has died. And so we thank the Lord for that. I'm thankful for sellers. Amen. <laughs> and I don't know why it is, but per- periodically we just get sprayed with tornadoes. And, and uh, people often ask, well, why does that happen on this beautiful planet that we live on? Well, there is a reason. There's a reason to life. And there's a reason that planet Earth can sometimes just go bananas and get out of whack. And the reason is that when God created the heavens and the earth, he created a perfect place uh, for us to live. And it was a place that was so beautiful and perfect. There were no storms. It didn't even rain. Uh, The Lord watered the earth with a mist. And uh, there was no sin, no problems, no death, uh, no cancer, no health issues. It was a beautiful place. But God told Adam and Eve that you can eat of all the fruit in the garden except for the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, if you eat at that fruit on that day, you will die. Well, the old serpent tempted Eve and she partook of the forbidden fruit. And then she gave some to her husband, uh, Adam, and he ate some too. And so sin entered the world and sin has passed from one man to all men. And because sin entered the world, just as God said, it brought death with it. You see, we're under the, 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 the penalty of death. The wages of sin is death because of sin. And so now this beautiful planet, gorgeous and beautiful every day, everywhere. It's an incredible place. But every once in a while, the sky will just boil with great storms and tornadoes will spray out because we live on a groaning planet because of sin. And we have to deal with it. The Bible calls it in Romans chapter 8, a groaning planet because of sin. Well, I want to invite you this morning to take your Bible and turn to Romans, the 15th chapter, if you will. Romans chapter 15, and I want to continue for a moment with this theme. Being a groaning planet, we not only have to deal with tornadoes, but we have to deal with all kinds of things. In life, and some things just aren't really pleasant. Things can cause us pain. And, and today, as we, as we continue in this coronavirus strategy to flatten the curve of the growth of this deadly thing, and as we think even about rolling out and returning back to normal, some semblance of normality and getting kind of back to normal and, and recovering our economy and moving forth, Um, as we wrestle with the issues surrounding all this strategy, one of the things that many people around us are dealing with is something called disappointment. Disappointment. Uh, Just think about it. I mean, the NBA canceled their season this year, the National Basketball Association. The NCAA College Basketball canceled March Madness. My goodness, the PGA Tour is on hold. The NCAA has also canceled uh, uh, their baseball uh, games this year. My, my wife and I, in fact, in a, in a couple of weeks, we were expecting to be in Lubbock, Texas, to watch Texas Tech play baseball because Texas Tech was planning on fielding a great team this year and competing for the national championship. And, Uh, I I grew up in Lubbock, went to Texas Tech, met my bride who came out to Tech. And so we we follow our school. We want to go out there and watch some baseball. But now that's over. And and, uh, those kinds of things cause disappointment. Think about our high school students. They worked a lifetime 
to get to this place to be a senior in high school and go to a senior prom, have a graduation ceremony, a recognition ceremony, get their awards and, and talk about their accomplishments, not to mention the fun of just being a senior and cruising to the finish line. Think about the disappointment that causes high school and kids and college kids. They can't compete in their athletics at this time because life has been disrupted. And uh, so, so we deal with things like disappointment, not to mention the fact I hadn't had a haircut in several weeks and most of you can't tell it, but I have more hair, more hair than the last time you guys saw me. I can't wait. Maybe in a week or two, I can have a haircut, praise the Lord. And so uh, some of it's kind of fun and funny, but some of it, guys, is painful. Disappointment can be painful. So I want to I wanna speak to you today from two verses in the Bible. The first one is Romans 15, verse 5, where the Bible says in verse 5, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grants you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Beloved, the question becomes, does God have counsel for us? Does he have a plan for us in terms of dealing with disappointment? Actually, he does. And I want to share with you today, because if you're dealing with some dis disappointment, and likely most of us are, here are some thoughts about how to counter and deal with disappointment that hurts us. Number one is this. Keep your heart and your mind strong. Keep your heart and your mind strong. I want to tell you, I hold the Bible in my hand. The Bible is not an ordinary book like all of the books. The Bible is God's book. The Bible is God's holy word. History reveals to us that there have been many, many attacks on the veracity of the Bible. There have been multiple, multiple attempts to extinguish the Bible from planet Earth. Just get rid of it. People have burned hundreds and thousands of copies of the Bible to get rid of it. That's Satan's way. Because you see, the Bible is not an ordinary book. And, and even though people have had to try to discredit the Bible or tried to destroy the Bible, it still stands. Because in Isaiah 40, verse 8, God said this. He said, the grass, uh, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And the Bible stands because God said it would stand. The Bible is uh, also active because God superintends his word. He said in Isaiah 55, 11, he said, Then shall my word be, which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me void, without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I have sent it. God says his word will perform the task. And so this is no ordinary book. It is the Bible. It is God's holy word. And so if you will do this, take the time to have a daily quiet time every day if you can. I recommend it every day, but at least four or five times a week. Get up and spend time with the Lord. Have a steady intake of the Word of God because the Bible says in Psalm 1 verse 1 through 3 that if you do that, if you'll soak your mind in the Word of God, you'll be like an oak tree planted by streams of water and in its season, its leaf does not wither. And that means that if you will strengthen your mind and heart with the Word of God, when you face disappointment, you'll get through it much more easily than otherwise because you're stronger than you've ever been before. You see, the Bible says about the Bible in Hebrews 4 verse 12 that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and it is able to it is able to separate <clears throat> the soul and the spirit both joints and marrow the bible says and to judge the intentions and the thoughts of the heart the bible is living active and sharp because it is god's word 
And so when you take the word in, the word will produce life in you. And I was reading just uh, the other day that Charles Stanley said that the word of God brings a, a living counsel, a living guidance, a living hope, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a living um, confidence for life. And so soak your mind in the Word of God. And then here's secondly, here's second thought. Secondly, <clears throat> beware of idolatry. Beware of idolatry. <clears throat> Sometimes we experience disappointment in such a way that we get a little bit unhappy and even hurt with God. Sometimes we want something so badly. And our, our desires get frustrated. Our dreams become a little shattered. Our hopes don't work out sometimes. We experience this, experience this disappointment and we get hurt with and hurt at God sometimes. And what that reveals to us is, is that the thing that we want has become more important than God to us. You see, when we get so hurt with God because we didn't get something we strove for, that we hoped for, that means that we want that something more than we want God. And friend, can I tell you something? That's idolatry. That can be an idol of the heart. Here's why. God said in the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And so he wants us to worship him first and foremost. Let me, let me give you an example of that of this. Um, uh, Arm & Hammer is a company that makes baking soda. And Arm & Hammer is a, is a well-known brand name. Uh, you, you think of baking soda, you think of Arm & Hammer, right? Because nobody can really compete with them. Nobody has competed with them. It has a veritable monopoly in the marketplace. So when you think of Arm & Hammer, you think of baking soda because it's kind of a monopoly Nothing competes with them in the marketplace. Well, can I tell you something? God wants a monopoly in your heart. He wants you to worship Him and Him only with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. God does not want anything or anyone competing for market share in your heart. He wants 100% market share in your heart. And when you give Him that, God will walk with you, grow you, change you, teach you, and, and friend, he will bless you until you can't stand it anymore because he's an awesome God. Does he have all your heart today? Or does he have only a little bit of your heart today? Can I tell you something that in your heart there's, there's only one throne? It's not a two-seater. That throne is made for Jesus and nobody else, not you and Jesus not you, Jesus, and somebody else, but just Jesus. Friend, give him all your heart. And especially think about it when you're facing and dealing with disappointment. Thirdly, here's a third thought. Be alert to the devices of the devil. Friend, listen, you are in a spiritual warfare. And you may say right there, you may say, well, now, brother pastor, let me tell you something. I don't believe in God. You may be saying, well, now listen, you may be a Christian. You may be in a spiritual warfare like you guys say, but I don't, I'm not. I don't know anything about that. Well, can I tell you something, friend? You are in a spiritual warfare, and the devil already has the upper hand in your life because he's convinced you to say there is no God, even though you know there's a God by what you see, what God has made, and what you hear. Because you see, when you sin, even though you don't believe in God, even though you haven't read the Ten Commandments or read the Bible, when you sin, you feel guilty. And you will experience shame because your conscience afflicts you because you broke God's law. So hear me today. To say there's no God is to deny what you see in terms of the works of his hand of this creation and deny what you hear in terms of your conscience. Friend, let me tell you something. There is a God. And you are in a warfare. And then, dear Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, you are in a warfare, and Satan has devices 
to keep you from living a victorious life. He uses disappointment. He uses discouragement. Those two go closely together. He, he uses depression. He uses despair, the devices of the devil to hinder you, to slow you down, to keep you from having joy and victory in your life. I hope you're taking notes because here's how you combat the devices of the devil. You combat them with an attitude of gratitude. The Bible says in everything, give thanks for that is God's will for you. You combat the devices of the devil with gratitude. Well, what do you mean by that, Brother Bill? Well, here's what I mean. When disappointment comes into your life, stop. You can even get a pen and some paper and sit down and count your blessings. Sit down and count all your blessings. Get your mind off what you don't have and get your mind on what you do have and give God thanks for the many, many blessings that he has given to you. We sing a song sometimes called Count Your Blessings. Name them one by one because counting your blessings will help you overcome the disappointment of whatever it was that you lost and you realize how blessed you are right here, right now. I mean right where you're sitting. You are very, very blessed of God. There's a story told that a farmer went out into a barn one time and he found Satan's seeds, seeds that he plants in the hearts of people. And he went around looking at the different kinds of seeds that there were, and there were all different kinds. But then he came to one package of seed, the seed of disappointment. And he talked to the devil about it, and the devil said, that seed works in every heart except one. And the farmer said, which heart is that? He said, it's the heart that is full of gratitude. That seed will never, ever work. <laughs> and that's true. That's true. You overcome disappointment by counting your many, many blessings. Hallelujah. Aren't you blessed today? Aren't you thankful to God? Mm. God is so good to us. You have air to breathe, water to drink. You live in the greatest country on earth. You're free. Praise God. Count your many, many blessings. You say, well, I don't like my job. <laughs> well, but what would you think of that job if you were in the unemployment line today? And may I say this, if that's where you are today because of this coronavirus, I want to ask you to draw near to God. Draw near to God because uh, uh, he's going to help you through this season. He's going to help you through this season. And then here's the next thought that I want to share with you about overcoming disappointment. And that is cultivate a faith response. Cultivate a faith attitude. Cultivate faith thinking. Faith thinking. You know, you know so many times when we deal with disappointment. I mean, I, I do this too, but some, so many times we will say, well... That didn't work out for me, and no wonder it didn't work out for me because uh, seldom does it work out for me. Most of the time it don't work out for me. I'm not surprised this one didn't work out for me either. I'm disappointed. That's the way I live, disappointed. People say, well, God will never let you down. Well, well, I don't know. I don't know if I believe what they say or not. Can you listen to that line of thinking? That line of thinking is defeat thinking. You are defeated. I am defeated when I'm thinking like that. And believe me, I love you. And I know how that feels because I've had uh, my share and then some of negative, defeated, unbiblical, faithless thinking. Friend, when we face disappointment, well, let's even begin now. And whether we have disappointment or not, let's cultivate faith thinking. Here's what faith thinking says. Faith thinking says that problems are platforms. Problems are platforms on which we get to see how great God really is. Here is a faith statement. Setbacks are setups 
by which we see how much God really loves me. That is faith thinking, setbacks or setups to walk with God through a time of difficulty. And it's the same way with disappointments. Here's a, here's a faith thought. Disappointments are appointments with God. Do you hear me today? If you have a disappointment in your life, that's an appointment with God for you to discover how wonderful He really, really is. Faith thinking is what we need. I was preparing for this message and I read uh, something published in the book, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. It's about a 68-year-old man one evening who came to his place of business and stood on a curb across the street from it because the whole thing was on fire. The problem was, too, that he was 68 years old and his son was standing there with him and his son was grieving for him because most of his life was behind him. And another problem was he had that his business was insured for $238,000, but the business was worth $2 million and he's standing there watching the thing burn to the ground. Well, this 68-year-old man did something very interesting. He looked to his son and he said, go get your mother. And bring her here. She, she, she's never seen anything like this and she won't see it again. Bring her here. So he did. Well, the next morning, this man gathered all of his employees on that same curb where he watched his business burn to the ground. And he told his employees, he said, I want to tell you something. Disappointment and disaster are opportunities for you and I. Disappointment and disaster are good things. You know why? You know why this fire is a good thing? It's because God has burned up all of our mistakes and we get to start all over. And I give thanks to God that today we get to start fresh and new. Wow, you talk about faith thinking. This guy had it. Well, let me tell you about this guy. Three weeks later, Thomas Edison, that's his name, he released something called a phonograph, and it went round the world because he was a faith thinker. Do you hear me today? Mm, what a great story. And then there's a fifth and final thought that I would share with you. Remember, the Bible says in Romans 15, 5, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus Look at that word. It says, God gives perseverance and encouragement. That word perseverance means to, to stay with it. It means that even though you are disappointed, even though it's hard, even though it's an uphill climb every single day, if you ask God, he will give you the strength and the power to persevere. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you go to your heavenly Father, and you say, Father, I feel weak, I'm tired, I'm disappointed, I'm discouraged, I'm depressed, I need help, I cannot stay with it. God will give you the strength and the power you need to persevere so that you could stay with it until he's done with this trial in your life. That much I promise you, because he's the God who gives perseverance. But more than that, he is the God who gives encouragement. When you talk to God about your encourage, about your discouragement or your disappointment, he will encourage you and lift your spirit and give you hope and give you the strength to go yet one more day. And that brings me then, that thought brings me to the final point, and that is this. That is this. <clears throat> when you are dealing with disappointment, take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to your Father. Take it to the Lord. You know, we sing another song. It goes like this. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not take everything to the Lord in prayer. Quit trying to solve the problem yourself. I want to say to America today, stop trying to solve the coronavirus problem yourself. Get on your knees and ask God for a vaccine. America, get on your knees and pray and ask God to give us a vaccine, and God's going to give us a vaccine. Do you hear me today? 
or he's going to handle it in some way that he chooses. All he has to do is think it, and that thing will evaporate. We'll never hear of it ever again because, folks, he's God. Do you hear me today? <laughs> I love him, man. He's God. Hallelujah. And so pray, but take it to the Lord in prayer. Here's what I want you to do. If, you, if you're suffering with disappointment right now, or the next time you deal with it, I want you to get your Bible. I want you to get a pen and a paper, maybe a journal. Some people keep a journal. Take your journal. Go to some place in your home or go sit out under uh, the patio out there under a tree or go to a state park or a park somewhere out by the lake and get alone with God. Get you a cup of coffee or a glass of tea or a bottle of water. Get alone with God and take your disappointment to the Lord. Talk to him about it. Say, Father, I tell you, Father, I've set these goals and these hopes and dreams, and it just feels like I hit a, I hit a closed door when I turn left. When I turn right, I, I hit a closed door. I'm disappointed. I was hoping for this, this good thing to happen for my family. And, Father, I'm hurting right now. Could you help me, Lord? And you talk to your Father about it. Talk to him. He gives you this invitation. Write it down. James 4, verse 8. It's an invitation to you. He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near unto you. Wow. What an invitation. God, the God who made the heavens and the earth, invites you to come and draw near to him with the promise that he will draw near unto you. And I promise you he will. He said he will. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I want to tell you that this morning when I, or excuse me, uh, this week when I was praying for this message and, and uh, uh, I believe it was Thursday actually when I was talking to the Lord about this message and early in the morning the Father reminded me of some things uh, in my past, and things He had done in my life and He touched me and I wept and He just gave me uh, an explosion of thoughts this one time about things I needed to say and to do, and I just had a good time with the Lord last Thursday morning. And he reminded me of something that he did in my life years and years ago when my kids were at home. He reminded me of a movie. Come out in 1994, and I, I showed that movie to my kids, and, and really this movie ought to be in, in your uh, collection at home for your kids and grandkids. It's called Angels in the Outfield. It's about some little orphan children that stay in a foster home. And it's about a baseball team that they kind of like called the California Angels. And it's about a baseball team that was struggling. They couldn't win a game to save their lives. They were really struggling. And the story tells about how the orphans would, would go and, and look over the fence or something and, and see the angels play a little bit of baseball. And the story goes about how they just sort of walked with the team. And you, you, you watch the movie. But there was a little orphan girl one day who prayed. She took it to the Lord in prayer. And she prayed for the California angels. And she asked God to do something to help this team and, or send an angel or something to help God. Well, it was kind of laughable to the other kids and to the foster parents and I guess and to the, certainly to the players of the California Angels. But I want to tell you something. God answered that prayer in the movie. And so he, he sent angels to help the California Angels. And uh, one of my favorite parts of that is, is a time when they had a pitcher throwing to baseball, throwing to home plate. He had nothing left in his arm. He was wore out, tired. His arm was weak anyway. He couldn't hardly get the ball to, to the plate, much less throw a strike or throw with any speed. And as the show goes, uh, the camera turns to the pitcher. He's getting ready to fire to the plate, and there's an angel that shows up behind him. And the angel cocks his head like this, and he sticks his tongue out like that, and he's flapping his wings, and the pitcher throws the ball to the plate, and he goes, whap, like that, and that ball goes to the catcher's mitt, and boom, dust flies off the mitt, and the catcher stands up, and he has a startled look on his face. He's like, where did that come from? That hurt my hand. <laughs> now, you listen to me. 
When I saw that, and even today, when I think about it, it makes me want to weep. That's just a movie. But in real life, God has angels. Do you hear me? That's just a movie. But in real life, when God shows up in your life, man, and he moves this and moves that, and disappointment goes out the door, and encouragement comes in the heart, let me tell you something, he's God. And it just breaks my heart. He's so wonderful and so good to us. Well, Brother Bill, would he send an angel into my life? Well, Hebrews 1.14, write it down. Hebrews 1.14, angels are ministering spirits sent out to minister to those who are the heirs of eternal life. And if you know Jesus, friend, you got some angels in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe there's two angels walk with me all the time. My wife calls them Pete and repeat. <laughs> How about that? But I'll tell you this. I know God works in our lives. Do you hear me today? And so if you're disappointed, take you to the Lord in prayer. And I want to tell you something about that movie. There was a little boy named PJ. PJ had faith thinking. Well, the kids would be sitting around and talk about how the angels could never win a baseball game. And PJ would say, it could happen. The orphans would sit around and say, we'll never have parents to live with someday. And PJ would say, it could happen. Once he met the head coach of the angels in this movie and the angels, uh, the, the coach was saying, there, there'd be no angels come down here to help my baseball team. And PJ said, PJ said it could happen. Fred, I won't tell you something. Take you to the Lord in prayer. I don't know if he's going to send an angel your way to deal with your disappointment, but can I tell you this? It could happen. But here's what I know will happen. One way or another, God will work in your disappointment. He'll do something in that. He'll use it for his purpose. He'll use it to glorify himself in your life. He'll use it to strengthen you, grow you, change you, and he'll bring you out of it in due season. And you will marvel at how wonderful God really is. But there's one proviso. You have to know him. And the only way you can know him is to be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. You have a sin problem and that sin problem separates you from God. And I want you, if you will, to take your Bible and turn just for a moment. I'm going to close with this thought. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Now, I want to show you something very important in the Bible. But I want to ask you right now, are you saved? The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Is there a time in your life where you have come to Christ by faith and repentance? And God changed you. You were born again by faith in Jesus. Has that happened in your life? Are you saved? And you might say, well, uh, I don't know. I, I would ask you a question. If you died today, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? A lot of people say, well, Man, I don't know, but I just try to, I just try to live a good life. I, I do. I live a pretty good life. Can I tell you something, friend? There's no good people in heaven. There'd be no good people in heaven, not a single one. The only people in heaven are those who acknowledge their sin, come to the Savior Jesus who died on the cross to pay for thy, their sins. They come in repentant faith. He saves them. It's those folks who are going to be in heaven, sinners saved by the grace of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you saved? If you die today, would you go to heaven or to hell? Some people say, well, I just try to do the best I can. You know, you know I'm better than so-and-so over there. Well, let me tell you something. Let me tell you how that works. Let's say that you and so-and-so and another so-and-so decided you'd go to California and Los Angeles. And you're going to swim across the ocean to Hawaii. Let's say you did that. 
Both of you got on the beach and you started at the same time and you got in the water, took off swimming. And let's say that that so-and-so over there uh, couldn't go past three miles and, and he quit and he was about to drown if somebody didn't get him out of the water. And, but you're still going. Well, let's say that the other so-and-so, he goes five miles before he gets tired and has to quit, but you're still going. And let's say that you go 10 whole miles and you've beat them all over the place swimming towards Hawaii. Let me tell you something. You're still not in Hawaii. You may have got 10 miles. You may have beat them, but you didn't get to the goal. You didn't get to Hawaii. And can I tell you something? It doesn't matter how good you think you are in relation to so-and-so and so-and-so. God requires perfection. Get your eyes off so-and-so and get your eyes on Jesus. And when you do, you'll realize you need a Savior. And friends, you need the Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. God gave His Son to die on a cross for your sins, that by faith in Him, you might have eternal life. Now, here's what I wanted to show you. Here's the key. Here's the key. And I call it the forgotten word of the gospel. I want to set it up this way. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, and then when he went out into the wilderness to fast and pray for 40 days and 40 nights to launch his ministry, and then when he launched his ministry, he went out, and when he began to preach, what would you think would be the first word he would say? Would he say, or did he say, well, God loves you, or God saves you by grace, God's into you? Would he, would he say that? Let me show you the first word he said when he preached his first sermon in the fourth chapter of Matthew, verse 17. He said, the Bible says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Listen to me, beloved. In this country, this beautiful country we live in, truth is covered up by so many false ideas in the marketplace, it's unbelievable. People weave their own theologies about how to relate to God. Is there a God? Or how to go to heaven when they die. There's so many people around us who say they believe in Jesus, but they live like the devil. So many people around us say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but their life glorifies the enemy. So many people who redefine sin and call it something else. I, I, listen, I didn't commit adultery. I just had a one-night fling. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. Do you see what I'm talking about? It's not a fling. It's adultery. God wants us to repent of that. It's not gay. It's homosexuality. And God wants us to repent of that. It's not a little white lie, a little story. It's lying and it's cheating and swindling. And God wants us to repent of those things, whatever it is, gossip and greed, whatever the sin is. God wants us to come with a repentant heart and place your faith in Jesus. Now listen, a repentant heart means that you agree with God that what he says is sin is sin. And friend, can I tell you something? What God says is sin is sin. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. I'm not here judging you. Listen to me. I'm not here judging you. Uh, I'm a sinner just like you're a sinner. But I met the Lord. And you meet the Lord when you come to him with a repentant heart in faith. Repentance means you agree with God that what he says is sin is sin. And that you have a desire to turn from your sin, know Jesus, and you ask him to help you live holy and right before the Lord. That's repentance. You can't overcome sin by yourself. You can't quit that habit. You can't unchain that chain that's around you. It might be, it might be booze. It might be drugs. It might be 
pornography or sex, but you're bound some, by some chain. You can't break the chain, but I tell you, if you come to Jesus, he can. If the Son of God sets you free, you shall be free indeed. If you come to Jesus, the Bible says, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. Sin can no longer be your boss when you come to Jesus. Hallelujah. And so you don't come by cleaning up your life. You come and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I thank you that you rose from the dead. I thank you that you said if I would come to you and I want to turn from my sin and I believe in you that I could be saved. That's the way you come. Just like that. That's all. And if you do, he'll save you. And oh, friend, oh, friend, you will never regret it. You'll go away rejoicing in the Lord. Rejoicing. I tell you, I had a life before Jesus and after Jesus, and my life after Jesus is far greater than my life before Jesus. Because <laughs> for one thing, I'm free of the things that bound me. Hallelujah. He wants you to be free today too. Would you, would you bow your head for just a moment right where you are? Right where you are, would you bow your head and would you say to God, Father, I'm a sinner. And would you say to God, Father, thank you for giving your son Jesus for my sins. And would you right where you are pray and confess your sin and ask the Lord to save you. It's a simple prayer for salvation. It's a simple request. It's a simple call upon the Lord. Lord, save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Uh, there's no religious talk. There, there's no special word. It's just from your heart. Lord, I need you. That's all. Would you say it to him right now? Lord, I need you. Would you pray? Would you seek him? Lord, I need you. Lord, I, I repent of my sin. Lord, I confess my sin. And Father, we love you today and praise you and thank you for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the incredible word of God. Mm. Thank you, God, for loving us so much. You gave us your son, Jesus. And thank you for working in our lives. We love you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you tuned in today, and uh, if you came to Christ today, or if you made a renewed commitment to Him, or God touched you in a way, would you look at the address there and uh, send us a note and let us know what God's doing in your life? And if you're in Durant, Oklahoma, come down to Fairview Baptist and see us on a Sunday morning about 1030. We'll be glad to see you big time. Hopefully, we'll be together again in just, a, just two or three weeks, we hope. We love you and praise you. God bless you. Bye-bye.